your your timeline's very interesting. So we'll we'll dress yeah. this up the best way that we can. We'll take the picture in the best way so we all look good. So at the end of the day, thank you very much for taking a minute out. I appreciate it. And I would love to begin our conversation. We've kind of talked a little bit about it. You know, four years ago, this pandemic began and we were all like, what are we doing? Where is it going? So right. now that we're kind of out of it, how did you survive the pandemic and how did it change you? Oh, boy, that's a great question. Yeah. Because I'm still feeling the effects of it. Yeah. In the tax debt world that I live in. Um most of my work happens at the state and federal levels representing clients who have a tax debt issue. They're getting these love notes from the IRS in the state. And then you call the IRS of the state and they're understaffed. They haven't had the training for the seasoned people who had been there before COVID who ended up leaving or retiring and weren't replaced until just recently with newbies coming in. Um, you're dealing with people at the, the state and the federal level who don't know how their side of the game is supposed to be handled. And it has made everything so chaotic. What used to be, oh, client, I'll be able to get the first tier of negotiations handled within the next three weeks. Yeah. Now it's, I don't know, I've sent it in and we're waiting. If it even gets processed by the mail system at the state or the federal level. If not, we may have to resubmit. So what used to take uh, four to six weeks to handle is now four to six months. And it's tough. It has turned our entire industry on its ear. One of my best friends of all time lived uh, in Seattle and came back to Kansas City and had to get uh, find some work just some stopgap stuff. And he started working at the IRS building in downtown Kansas city. Ooh. And he was like, Oh my, like yeah. just what you said on a very cellular blue collar civilian level. He's like, I have no idea what's going on here. Yeah. It's, it's pretty amazing. And when you look at where our country is and what our, where our States are financially, they're hurting for revenue. Yeah. Right. So where they're putting the target and where they're trying to minimize that tax gap is they're turning to all the people who have bills owed. Right. Gotcha. So they're sending nasty collection letters and then you call and you can't get answers. It's making this horrible situation. It's very stressful on both sides. Yeah. The one thing I, I, I don't know if you can validate this or not, and this is just me reading reports, is that. Colorado was the first state that did this, which a lot of the revenue that came from marijuana sales was mm -hmm. supposed to alleviate a lot of this debt and a lot of these financial woes that would happen. Is that, Are you noticing that? I would say no. Okay. Okay. I would say no. You know, at first they had earmarked the money to go to school, you know, funding schools. And then they were like, oh, no, wait, we can't do that with to put it bluntly, drug money, right? Gotcha. Revenues made from something that the federal government won't recognize. Oh, right? I the gotcha. cannabis industry has gone, has taken us in a very strange direction. Yeah. So I will tell you, yes, we have record-breaking marijuana sales out here in Colorado, but nobody seems to know where those tax revenues are actually being applied. Okay. All right. I gotcha. I gotcha. Yeah, that is a weird quagmire because there's all these state regulations and then you got the federal things and then people are like, well, we don't want to use drug money, but Anheuser-Busch sponsored this big event and this big thing right. or Coors helped build this school. It's like, okay, so Coors <laughs> is okay. <laughs> all right. Anyways. Yeah. So, yeah it's, a, it's a very strange rabbit hole that you can go down and look at it from all sides and say something just isn't connecting right here. It's yeah. like. It's like with COVID. I wear my mask the whole time walking into the restaurant while I order my food and people are straining to be like, what did you say? And then the whole meal, the mask is off and you're breathing everything out. <laughs> and then you put it back on to leave. It's like, it's like a far side comet. Like, yeah, it's like the school for the gifted. They're like closing the door. It's like, <laughs> it felt like that the whole pandemic. Like, what are we doing? I want to scientifically yeah. be sound, but how illogical is all of this? To just... I know. 
well, and then the people who bucked it were shamed by right. the people who were wearing masks. Uh -huh. It was a, it was a very divisive situation that our whole country fell into. And and you wanted to do the right thing. Yeah, sure. Right. Yeah. Like my mom was going through cancer treatments at the time. Yeah. And we were just like, can we see you? What do we do? And she said, listen, I'll wear a mask for me just because my my uh, whole immune system is compromised. Yep. You don't need to do that. Sure. I will. Yeah. And that was a very poignant um, turning point for me. Yeah. And looking at it kind of differently, it's like, yeah, if you are compromised, take care of you. Sure. But at some point, where do all of us get to take the mask off? So, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It was an interesting time. Yeah. Definitely. It was, it was one. I remember at one point, Mike Judge, the guy that did Beavis and Butthead, was a real satirical guy and made some movies. And he made a movie at one point about America and the future. And it was weird and scary. And you laughed, but it was still scary. And it's kind of like yeah. it transpired into that. It's like, wow. Because it's kind of the or whole Orwellian thing. Like, we read these novels growing up, 1984 and all these other ones, where it was like, we're going to get to this weird place where government's going to have access and film everything and all this. And we're like, I don't know. And then mm, now you're like, what? That. Yeah. Yeah. And it's now it's on. like, oh, boy. Did yeah. he have a glimpse into the future what or saying. what? And what warning signs should we start paying attention to? I know. Right? I know. Well, I, I think at the end of the day, you know, what I realized, my son's on the spectrum and I've realized there's a lot of things that I'm not in control of. And especially with the pandemic that happens, the only thing that we can really be in control of as human beings is how well we love each other, how well we take care of each other. That's something that we can control. So all of this other malarkey and nonsense that's going to happen around us, is going to happen. It could deepen. But if you can lay your head down on the pillow at night and be comfortable with what you're doing as a human on this planet, that's probably something that means more than anything else. Because all of these other silly forces that are around us, we're just going to have to deal with, you know? Completely. Completely. It's so funny. It's always that stick to your own side of the street. Yeah. Right? And yep. feel good about what you do every day. Try yep. to do no harm, harm to others. Yep. And just... Be comfortable in your own skin, knowing that you're doing what you need to do, what you feel compelled to do, and, and that you feel like you're living a virtuous life. Yeah. Right? But at the end of the so, day, I think the whole power of karma is very real. And those of us that know that it's real, that's why we stay in our lane. Because it, <laughs> because it will. It'll No matter what it is, no matter what silliness that we see out there. Like, for instance, we look at someone like Bill Cosby. How many years, how many people in Hollywood knew what was going on? How many people just didn't do it because too much money was being made? Too many reputations needed to be saved. But you know what? Karma, it, it somehow, whatever you believe in, those forces come together. And it's like, that's just being a human on this planet. It's going to happen. I know, I know. And, and how disappointing was that? Oh, my God. Right? I, I was like... We grew up with the Huxtable family yeah. on TV once a week, yeah. right? Like yeah. they were cool. They, they they addressed some of the issues going on at the time, you know, and presented themselves as, as this wonderful family. And then you find out he was doing that on the side. It just, oh, man. I, I just feel bad for the African-American community because there's always been such a struggle to get to a point where there's this shining example of yeah. somebody that's doing things in the right way. Not to say that the rest of us humans aren't the same boat, but for, 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 you know, people that have been historically, um, you know, treated and maligned in a way that's been unfair. It's like, I just can't believe that that happened to, and there's just all these other examples of people, but it goes to what you're saying about the abhorrent behavior of these people that are movie stars that we are right. supposed to say they're glorified existences, but a lot of them might be clunkheads. Just when you get in a room totally. with them, you're like, my God, we think you're cool. Like, what is this? You know? I know. I know. Well, every time, I, especially with all the social issues coming up right now, you know, the police and the protests and all yep. of this. Yep. And when you start hearing them weigh in on one side or another, you're like, oh, no, you didn't just do that. Did you yeah. did you really say that? Do you really feel that way? Because oh man, yeah, yeah, 
yeah, it's 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 bad. Yeah. It, it's bad. So I think we have a good handle on what you do for a living. Yeah. Um, but let's just reiterate it just to make sure it makes sense. I'm going to put you in front of a bunch of third graders at career day. One of the kids says, hey, what do you do for a living? How do you answer that child? Oh, boy, that is a great way to pose it. Okay. So our state and federal uh, municipalities, right, our nation and our states have to have funding to lay the roads, have schools in place, you know, take care of the public health care systems, pay your grandmother so she doesn't have to work, right? And in order to have those monies, the state and our nation charge a tax on our income, on the money that all of us earn. And what happens is at times those monies never get paid over to the state or to our federal government. And when that happens, they start collecting it. They start knocking on your door, sending notes saying, you owe us this money. We really need you to pay that back. And I step in to represent the business or the individual to work out a solution to that bill. So third what grade it, enough? hundred percent. And that, and that's, <laughs> I think it's very essential for kids to understand how it works because yeah. schools are funded by the government. There's a lot of things that are a part of that infrastructure. Yeah. So it's totally key. So what did you want to be in the third grade? What was your dream? Oh boy. I think I wanted to be a, a veterinarian. Okay. Yeah. And then, you know, as I got older, school felt like a grind. Yeah. Like I loved it when I was younger, but the older I got and the more they made me take like science classes and I didn't want to do science, right? Mm -hmm. In college, I was like, nope, I'm out. Yeah. And then I went and at times I was working two and three jobs at a time to make ends meet. And I happened to answer an ad for an assistant for a company that handled tax debt. Yeah. And I remember the day I, I had my interview, I called my dad. My dad's a retired lieutenant colonel now right, from the yeah. army. And I called him and I said, hey, dad, I just had this really interesting interview. But have you ever heard of people not paying their taxes? <laughs> and I could hear him. I was in Colorado. My dad's in Alabama. And I could hear him shaking his head. Oh, daughter, you have so much to learn. Yeah, that happens. And I said, okay, good. Well, I just wanted to make sure it's legitimate. Do you think I should take the job? And he said, yeah, you know, if it seemed interesting, try it. And if you don't like it, you can find something else to do. Yeah. And I entered this world, I call it a happy accident, where it's dealing with numbers, with law, with helping people when they are coming to you with sleepless nights, worrying over these notes that they're getting from the IRS, these notices, these bills, tax liens getting filed against them, and they don't know what to do. They don't know how to address it. And the IRS and the states have done a very good job of creating this mental Im image of a guy showing up on your door, knocking, wearing like an overcoat and a uh -huh. fedora and a gun and a badge, uh -huh. and uh -huh. I'm going to take your firstborn child. I mean, that's what people think in their head when they see IRS, mm -hmm. right? So my job is to say, you know what? There is always a solution. Just follow my lead. I'm going to grab you by the hand. Yep. Think of me as a priest, confess everything to me, because if I know everything about your situation, I know how to navigate this to get you to a solution with as minimal harm done to you as possible. You're a financial therapist. Yeah, basically, yes. So, you know, in our modern world now, we have examples of Wesley Snipes that doesn't pay taxes and goes to jail. And right. basically, I, I think there's a conspiratorial notion out there I've read before where the IRS was constructed as kind of this meeting of the Rockefellers and other powerful entities that kind of created this in midnight legislation, things like that, you know, and they subscribe yeah. to that, you know, so. Sure, sure. Yeah. But, but if you think about it, the IRS is a nasty necessity. Right. Right. How else would the government collect the money needed for our military? Yeah. 
right, for our roads, for our schools. It, it's a necessity. And to tell you the truth, every big politician comes up and we're going to do tax reform. But all their donors really love all the credits they can uh -huh, claim uh -huh. and everything else. Uh -huh. So our system is never going to really materially change. Right. You'll have adjustments along the way, but our government is so dang big. How else would they fund it? Yeah, uh, of you know? course. It's. I mean, and the IRS only acts upon what Congress puts in law. Yeah. What they what they pass and what they mm -hmm. put in place. The IRS is just the grunts that go collect it and deal yeah. with it, right? Yep. Totally. So I love that whole defund the IRS movement because I'm like, oh well, that just doesn't make sense. It's, it's yeah, it's it's <laughs> stupid that people even think that's plausible, and it's people that are ignorant to what the real what what all of this money does for everybody you know right. And, right. and and ironically the people that yell the loudest about it are the ones that are on the lower rungs that get checks from the government and don't think that that's where it comes from it's just yeah it, yeah it, well they they don't critically think through it right right and that my favorite are the politicians who jump on the defund the irs bandwagon and i'm like okay you're just placating for votes at this point because you idiots all know pardon me i say idiot with some respect behind it sure um but they all know how this works so and, yeah and the administrations that yell about it the most are the ones that give tax breaks to people that don't need them and right. are the ones that really kind of laden all the blue blue collars down with extra fees that we don't need. <clears throat> we need the relief as the workforce out here doing yeah. the, the work. So yeah, all of it's just a big ironic soup, you know. It's it's so strange when you yeah. really start critically thinking uh -huh. through how it all connects. Uh -huh. It really is, you know. And you've heard you've heard that um, the the notion of a flat tax, right? Just. Yeah. Everybody should just be taxed a flat amount at the federal level and at the, the state level, and that should be it. Yeah. But the problem is our government spend money like they're drunken sailors. <clears throat> There's no way yeah. they could budget on that. Yeah. So they have to leverage it so they get more than just that flat amount. Yeah. I had this really interesting idea once because if you talk to people and you say, well, how much money do you make? They're going to tell you what their net paycheck is every pay period right oh i get 25 58 every two weeks yeah. it's like no 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 but you earn more than that right and then you're taxed on it and then you use that money to go to the grocery store and you're taxed on your groceries and then you put gas in your car and you're taxed there then if you have a home you pay property tax on it mm -hmm. you have a vehicle you pay tax on it through your annual registration if you sat down and counted how much you pay in tax on a oh. monthly basis, oh. every single person would be in their local, state, and and uh, national representatives' offices jumping up and down about all the money our governments waste. And it's sad. When you look at the, it, we're talking billions and yeah. trillions of dollars. Yeah. Like, oh my gosh. That's why whenever you see pictures of how ornate the White House is, it's like, that's that's why we have all this money that comes in. It yeah. looks good for a reason because it's the biggest moneymaker. Um, I know. So of all of the things that you've done in your career and your life up to this point, what are you the proudest of? Oh, boy. Um, I know this sounds really kind of general, but honestly, it's all the clients who have said to me, when I call them and I say, we're done, we got it. Yep. Here's your final settlement. I've had grown men on the phone crying, just like, I cannot tell you what a difference you've made to our future. Yeah. I mean, that still gives me goosebumps. Yeah. That's heavy. That's you very know, heavy. It really is because they, they, when they come to me, clients are beside themselves. They can't sleep at night. They worry about their family. They worry about their future, their financial security. They see it all being threatened by the IRS and the state. And that's where it's like, I feel like kind of like a knight riding in. I put yeah. armor on and I go to battle, right? Yeah, I, that's I know right. it sounds cheesy, but that is that is what makes me proud and inspires me to have been doing this. Gosh, in September, it'll be 25 years that wow. I 
focus just in this area. Yeah. So I know that's not, that's not very, um, you know, a pinpoint example, but. No, that's, that's, that's what I'm going for. So yeah. at the end of the day, everyone that's all of the client, everybody that you, you've known, the clients and everyone around you, family, friends, they have a perception of you, but you're the one in control. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? Oh boy. Um, Oh, wow. That put me on my heels a little bit. Great question, Joe. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, somebody who's fiercely loyal and always fighting for the right thing. Um, I have a very strong ethical compass mm -hmm. that guides me with everything. But I will tell you, I'm the one person who doesn't think before they speak. I'm just like, this is how I feel. You are you want genuine? You want open? That's me. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good, just, that, that's good. Yeah. yeah we need that. Thanks. We need more honesty. Yeah. Morgan, this has been wonderful. If anyone wants to reach out, learn more about you, any of the good business, where do they go? Yeah. Goldenlionsolutions.com. Okay. You can reach out to me through there. My direct phone numbers on the website. You can find me on LinkedIn, Facebook. Yeah. I just, uh, we're an open book. We just want to help people who find themselves in this situation. Okay, excellent. And you're doing that. Morgan, this has been wonderful. It's been a delight to meet you. Thank you. Best of luck with everything. Thanks so much, Joe. It's been great. Thank you for having absolutely. me. Yeah, it's been absolutely. an honor. My pleasure.